All right, folks. So uh, if you have a question for our panel, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Let us know, and we'll come to you this time. Who is surprised that this guy has a question? Anybody? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Nobody, right? Me either. How many people is this the first time he's asked a question? <laughs> it's a Mandela effect. You just thought he asked questions all day. Uh, go ahead, sir, with your question for the panel. Um, so I have a – my question can be for everyone, but it was meant with um, more Tom and um, Mr. Marsh involved. And I, I – I, with a little bit of background, I already gave some some background to this question to uh, Roger Marsh. Uh, the idea goes like this. We are affecting each other in very unique ways. And when we run into each other and we have these abilities to make a commitment to a truth bubble, one of these has to win out over the other. I'm sort of wondering if you know that your first best intention could possibly remove the original, most authentic version of somebody from your life, is it best to commit to that truth bubble or moment of intention? Tom, go ahead first. Um, I'd like to hear that question again. I'm not, the, the truth bubble is not uh, yeah, I'll necessarily in my, meta, you know, one of my metaphors. So tell me again. Yeah. Um, so um, in the um, LCS, you have the ability to program. Sometimes your program, your choice, can inadvertently, you know, involve things being changed that you don't intentionally want to change. Sort of like a butterfly effect. You change one mm -hmm. thing, a thousand things change. One of those things can be if people have ever seen movies before, uh, even the movie The Butterfly Effect unintended consequences such as your very close loved ones could change you could all you know wake up one day without a brother you could wake up one day and that mandela effect is now very very close it's not something arbitrary like serial so the question then to me uh, and like i said it's for the whole panel when you're messing with something like timelines should you really be thinking about this? And is it re a really real threat in whether it's the vernacular of the LCS or in truth bubbles? Go ahead, Tom. I can answer, I can answer that as, yes, you should be thinking about that. You have to make your choices with as much understanding as the effect those choices are gonna make on other people as you can. But as you say, it might be four or five or six levels down where it's hard to understand. Well, what you do, and this is just a general uh, attitude in life, is that you should do due diligence. You think about it. You think how it might affect people and how those people will affect other people. And after doing due diligence, you make the best choice you can, the lowest entropy choice, the best choice for yourself and for others. And when you make that choice, then you go forward and you have to deal with the consequences of that. The other side is if you, if you worry too much about the things you can't control, you'll end up paralyzed and unable to make any choices at all. So the way that we learn and move forward is that first we have to be clear about what our choice is. We have to do due diligence and thinking about it and its ramifications and the possibilities that it, that it might influence. And then we say, what's the low entropy choice? What's the best choice here for myself and for everyone else? Then you make it. And after that, you know, the chips fall where they may and you get to learn something. So you look at the outcome and if the outcome was good, well then fine, you do more of those kinds of things. If the outcome wasn't so good, you have to analyze that and understand why it wasn't good. What did you miss? What did you not think about? And if you come to the conclusion, well, that's what I missed, but that was that information was just unavailable. I didn't have it. Well, then you just go on. You go on with that. So life works this way. Stuff happens, you get to deal with it. You deal with it the best way you can, make your choices, move on, and learn from the consequences and results of those choices. Next time, you'll make better choices. And if you keep doing that, as you go through life, you'll get 
more and more capable of making good choices. So it's it's not about I have to make the right choice. How do I know what the right choice is? Because my choice might affect somebody down the road that's that's terrible. You can't let those thoughts paralyze your ability to, to move forward. So you do the best you can, learn from the results, and keep on going. I like that answer. What about you, Mr. Marsh? What would be your answer be to that question? Yeah, I would just add a little bit to that. Just for me in terms of, I agree with everything that Tom said, I would just add in, you know, what's your personal criteria for making your choices? From where are you coming from? And as you saw in my talk, my intention is to come from love. So if I can ground myself in love for the highest and best for all, the criteria then is set. And can I look around and see that this choice that I'm about to make actually is coming from love and will create more love in the world, more beauty, more joy. Those are all flavors of love for me. Love is the root. And then there's appreciation, there's gratitude, there's joy, compassion, appreciation. Those are all flavors of love. For me, the love is the core of all of that. And so to the extent that you're creating some reality or some timeline, how rooted in love are you? And if you're rooted in love and you're making choices and you know that you're coming from there, then whatever happens is perfectly fine because you've made the best and highest choice you can make. And then you move forward from there. And people may disappear from your life. That was one thing you were pointing towards. You know, like, what if I start manifesting a particular timeline? I'm totally love-based, but I notice my family changing or friends disappearing, which has happened to me. I move in particular directions of conscious evolution why do these people disappear? Well, you can tell a lot of different stories, but I know I'm moving on the timeline that's appropriate for me and it's based in love. And I love those people that disappear from me. I love them into their next and highest, wherever they went, wherever that was. So that's part of what Tom was saying with respect to chips fall where they may. But when I know I'm coming from love for the highest and greatest of all, then those chips fall where they're supposed to fall. And that's okay. Yep. I agree 100%. When I said the best low entropy choice, another way of saying that would be the choice that's based in love. And I love that answer myself. Uh, 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 Chris or Sean, do you have anything you'd like to add to this gentleman? You can go first. Do I need to use this microphone? Yes, sir. I can't use the one that's over okay, here. Okay, so you, yeah, go ahead and use that one then so we don't do feedback. Yeah, I didn't realize you still had yours on. Because he has a microphone too. Oh, he so does too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I believe that what's happening is um, there are things, people being magnetically attracted to each other, frequencies that are similar, that are even repelling each other. So I remember um, there's a certain point before I began my awakening process where there was a certain group of friends that I had. And we go to football games and we go here and we go to the bar and go to, go to the club and all that. As your frequency starts to change, those people don't want to be around you anymore. And you don't, want, you don't want to be around them either. So the way I see it is that what's happening, and for all of us, is that either bonds are going to become stronger, or with ease and grace, we can start to separate from the things what we're not a frequency match for anymore. And we're attracting like-minded people into our bubble of reality, so to speak. What about you, Sean? Sure. If I understood your question right, and feel free to correct me and add on, if you, uh, you were going into what if, uh, like in a cautionary tale, uh, we expanded in this Mandel effect uh, ability spectrum physics of the reality, and it went off the rails and started manifesting a timeline in which our family members start disappearing. Is that right? You have an intention. This comes from love. Your intention. You have an intention. It comes from love. I have an intention, it comes from love. Whose intention wins? Mm. If I win, your family disappears. Okay. If you win, my family disappears. <laughs> uh, okay, well, this, so I love theoretical and uh, yeah, I'm just, hypothetical, so this one. It's just, so, it's cause and effect. Yeah, That's yeah, all so, I'm saying. so feel free to, you know, take this a little grain of salt. This is just how I've been able to perceive it with working with time psionics. Uh, yeah, it's a very sought after ability. The dark likes to steal it a lot, so there has to be high level authorities protecting that. So usually there's a maintaining structure around it that keeps kids from falling down the stairs or going into like playgrounds uh, that they're not supposed to uh, as they 
player with the abilities, usually people will get granted control over their own timeline, be able to heal it, make it better, and then go forward outward in alternate timelines and then be able to heal past lives and then be able to affect others as they show that they're responsible enough. If they show they're not responsible enough, it usually gets yanked from them until they're ready to graduate past a certain level. If it is, however, a dark being that is playing that game to begin with in theft for the ability, then that would be a, probably I, what I would call a timeline genocide which the purpose of that is to take someone out of the game that is a threat to them they perceive into the future. If, it's ever, if it was ever used by the light, I don't see them doing that that often, it would probably be because there's something really wrong going on with that family member to where they're not meant to be there somehow. And that, I'd say, is a rare case, and it would jar and cause trauma, so the reality does not tend to do that. Uh, Genocide, as I mean, like something with a high level authority, light or dark, go back in time, uncreate a being from ever existing. Which we, you wouldn't even be able to tell it happened unless you're one of the rare few that had a, has a reason for remembering. I have follow-up questions. I don't want to take this from you. <laughs> so I would say I, I'm going to follow that up personally and say that uh, I think it also has to do with the LCS. And I, if we don't all agree that uh, your family's got to die, that I don't think it would be a one-on-one. -on -one. That That's just my opinion. But I'm not the one on the panel, so my opinion don't matter, right? <laughs> I am going to take host privilege, though, uh, and ask a question. Uh, would you say, especially YouTube at all four, uh, that love, I've heard a lot about love today. And it's funny because Roger and Tom's talk, my goodness, you guys could not have flowed together any better with your talks today. It was amazing, the information I heard. Would you guys say that love is the cheat code to the game, the matrix, the simulation, whatever final, the conscious simulation, the LCS, uh, whatever final goal you tend to be uh, would you think or say that love is the cheat code to winning in the end tom yes absolutely although i wouldn't call it a cheat code it's not cheating that's the way the game's supposed to be played it uh that's how you evolve it's all about uh increasing the quality of your consciousness uh, growing up becoming love treating people with caring with with uh you know cooperation compassion you know that's what's important and if that's how you live your life then you're doing it right you're doing the right thing and it's not a, you know really a cheat code but I, I see how you you mean that you know is that the ticket yes that is the right. ticket it's it's growing yourself and growing yourself i should say we have to make a distinction about behavior and being it's not about acting kind it's about being kind. And there's a big difference between those two. It has to be authentic. It has to be who you are. And that's a much harder state to, to get in. You know, acting is not so hard. That's what we call, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, our image. And we go through life with an image of being kind or being nice and being this and being that. But that's not a ticket to anywhere. It's civilizing and everybody around you appreciates it, but it's not growing you up. So this is about being love, becoming love. And that's our purpose here. That's how we go. Now, I'd like to also say it doesn't mean that your life is always going to be easy and perfect. It doesn't mean that you're always going to get the, you know, the easy card de dealt to you. Things will happen in your life that will be painful and that may hurt. It doesn't matter so much what happens as how you deal with it. If whatever happens, you deal with it positively and with love, with caring, taking the low entropy path, which is the, the love path, then you will keep evolving and, and uh, you know, you'll be doing what you need to do. So what happens isn't so important. You're talking about like the family member, or I do this and something ho horrible happens to you. Well, it's not so much what happens, it's how do you deal with it? And you know, the things that are a little harder to deal with also have a little more potential for growth. The things that are really easy 
don't have nearly as much potential for growth. So when that hard stuff comes, you ought to go, ah, okay, this is a good opportunity. Now, what's the positive, loving way to deal with this that's good for me and good for everyone? I love that answer. And like you were saying in nature that you need stressors for growth. So you've got to have those stressors there in order to to move on and grow. But uh, I appreciate that. I I, I love that answer. uh, Roger, same question. Is love the ticket? Thank you, uh, by the way, Tom, for correcting the question. I like your wording better than my own. Yes. Uh, Is love the ticket to reality? Yeah, it's definitely the ticket, as we've been talking about. and it's not the easy road. It's not the easy road. Sometimes loving is harder than being hateful, angry, or reactive. So taking the time to respond is not always the easy thing. So it's the right thing, but it may not be the easy thing. So it's not a cheat code because I would also say, building on what Tom was saying about authentic love and being genuine, for some, loving ourselves is the hardest thing to do. We have to start with ourselves first and for the old, the old saying, which is you can't love another till you love yourself, is absolutely true. So we start with ourselves and we have to love ourselves into existence, into a genuine existence of love. I'm working on that. I've been working on that for a long time. I'm still, you know, at 57 years old, working on this, loving myself, a self-love. And from there, from this self-love, love of self, I can then love others. I can love the universe into its highest and best, into its existence of supporting me because I'm supporting me now. And if I'm the universe, then it starts with me. I'm supporting myself and then I can support others. So yes, love is the ticket, but it's not the easy path. In fact, when I see most of, fe- most of the fear-generated activity in my truth bubble, I notice that that is a lack of love. There's a lack of self-love there. I extend compassion. I extend love to those suffering souls that are creating the suffering that we're experiencing or that I experience in my truth bubble. So I'm responsible for that to a certain extent too. I may not want to take responsible responsibility for the tyrants that are in my space and for the you know terrible things that are taking place, but it's in my space. And so how can I love that, even that, into its highest and best to move on and move through? And as I was talking about leveraging that fear, leveraging that pain and birthing it into what's next. And I wanna circle back really quick to the previous question because I understood more what you said already. And in my world, it's not a competing timeline. It's not an either or. You could go into a timeline where my family is dead, but I would continue in the the timeline where my family is alive. So for me, it's all it's all happening now. And you're choosing the one you want to be in and I'm choosing the one I want to be in. And there's no competition there. There's not either or. So that's how it occurs in my in, in, in how I look at the universe and how I look at my universe. I'm not in competition trying to make a timeline work. I'm creating the one that I'm experiencing. And so is each and every one of you. So I think when you say authentic, both of you gentlemen mean uh, with with intent, not just acting on like you're loving, but love with real intent. I, I think is is the word that, that that's also being uh, uh, jumped over there. But uh, often authentically, intently, true loving, not just acting like you're loving, having that true intent of heart, if you will. Um, you too, Sean, uh, Chris. You have anything to add to this? Is love the ticket to reality? Yeah, I'll take it into left field a little bit, as I usually do. So, you know, besides... You said that, not me. (laughs) Besides what Tom and Roger were talking about, if you're going to talk about the way I perceive things, a a kind of, like, cheat code, to me, I call that sacred neutrality. So what is the highest frequency? The way I perceive that is being neutral. Because what happens is when you're not neutral, even if it's for a righteous reason the matrix can, let's say, energy harvest you. When you reach a point of neutrality, then all of a sudden you're no longer being observed. Your your energy is no longer being harvested. So as an example, they may try to, like people have been talking about, oh, are they going to bring back masks again? What's What's going to happen with that? And there's two sides to that story. There's the side of people that don't want to wear a mask, they think it's whatever, and there's the people that are like, you must wear a mask, you, you, could, you, could, you could kill me. So there's those two sides that are going to be happening if, if that plays out into any of our realities. So what's the best way to look at that? Neutrality. 
if you have to wear a mask someplace, wear a mask. Just don't let it bother you. Don't, don't be energy harvested over it. So when I, when I see this type of concept, I'm looking at that neutral, neutrality in a sacred means becomes like the highest, the highest frequency from my point of view. Excellent. And you, Mr. Sean? Okay, lovely. Uh, <laughs> so love is a big thing uh, in this reality. I, it's, I love it so much. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's very hard to describe. There are many words for love. It, uh, how I would describe it as an all-encompassing, full-spectrum energy that is close to source as possible in our way to perceive and feel it. Uh, and there are many levels to love. And we haven't even began to tap into the higher levels. So some of the biggest missions that I at least have for coming here is in a human body, on in this earth game realm, whatever you want to call it, uh, you can achieve a new level of love that you can't achieve anywhere else in the galaxy. This super hybrid tech that we're involved in that's like this grand human experiment of the merging of uh, the full spectrum of the melting pot of the mul uh, multiverse of light and dark into one for a conclusion and remedy and unity and peace and the ends of all wars. But anyway, uh, so love. So the opposite of uh, love is fear and hate and... Um, understanding the various spectrums of density and heaviness on our heart that uh, accumulate give us an experience when we break through that to the light within. Uh, see it as an aperture that you're opening in your heart to perceive more of the, as whatever, we're flying through space however many miles an hour, like wind coming into our heart, allowing us to perceive more of it. Uh, it's the connection between all things. It's, uh, it, it is like a cheat code, as in where it's this unlocking knowingness, greater level, once we aha moment kind of per perceive it and feel it, that it amplifies everything. It amplifies every psionic ability I've ever had. So it's one of the big core things to focus on because it uh, bleeds and uh, in a good way, like cup filth over into everything else. The heart field magnifies every type of energy that comes into it. And when you start generating tons of love and higher levels of love, you can perceive more, know more, feel more, uh, express more. He goes into cities, uh, which is the Hindu uh, thing for superhuman abilities. Right. And they talk about it as a symptom of achieving greater levels of consciousness. And this is what I'd go into. It, love is one of the things to focus on in the core that achieves new levels of consciousness. And part of it is transcending all these densities of negative emotions, negative experiences, things that hold us back that we perceive, define. And as we understand them, we turn them into our benefit in the foundation, into the fertilizer for our garden of happiness and love as we transcend those things towards maintaining resilient love in a higher level than we've ever been able to experience in other incarnations. Even if we touch upon the edges of that, it's a great victory. Thank All you. right, we have another question here, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to I have a couple questions. One, um, is it just a quick question about losing things that just disappear. I mean, literally disappear from. I've I've experienced many times just losing thing objects that I cannot find. Like I drop them and they're they're gone. Like I want to know if, if about that. If you guys have any um, information about that, and also I want to know about music and frequencies and how um, you know everything is sound. We know that everything is sound and frequency and shifting like a radio station different frequencies we have completely different realities uh, from those frequencies and you know what you suggest and how do you respond to that and how you switch frequencies i mean obviously love and gratitude and all that but i wanted to know where the role music might play in that what role music plays in switching reality is that the question um the frequency sound sound and frequency and how that um, affects our reality and how we can use it, um, like mantras and um, 
gotcha. vib- you know, vibrations of song and drums. And I'm a musician. I feel like it right. shifts. And I'm just curious if you guys have, you know, so, studied Tom, that. So, Tom, I'm going to let you tackle this one first, sir. Go ahead. Well, there was a there was also a little question in there in the beginning about losing things. I believe also, yes, things. and yeah, I'll start with that one, and then we'll do we'll go to music. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, losing things could could be very normal, or it could be very ne- paranormal. You know, losing things are just something we do. Particularly the older we get, we get a little more absent-minded and a little less connected with uh, with things. But I have a good story about uh, losing things my wife had a a set of earrings and uh, she lost one it just disappeared and about a month later she was getting out of her car at a big parking lot she she worked at a building that had maybe i don't know two thousand people and the parking lot took up probably a you know half a square mile and you never parked in the same place because it was always hard to get a space close by. You had to get the spaces out there. And one day she pulled the car up, parked it, got out, and her earring was right in front of her door. She opened the door, and there it was lying on the ground right in front of her. Well, she thought that was interesting. She picked it up, you know, and took it home and put it back with the one that was missing. They, she wore them for, oh, I don't know, six months or a year, and she lost it again. Well, this story went through three cycles. Three times she lost it. Three times it just reappeared someplace that she was. Not necessarily the two being connected. It could have, it could have, uh, you know, it came back to her uh, three times. Um, so that's, you know, losing things sometimes can be. A setup again with the larger consciousness system showing us that there's a lot more going on here than just you know what you know materialism would would say is possible a lot of things that are impossible happen and in my life the impossible happens almost every day you know it you begin to live in that space not just bump into it once in a while but you live in it so that's why things sometimes get lost. And I've also known that sometimes things just change places. Uh, I had a a friend who was on this path and he would find his cell phone in his sock drawer. And he'd have this cell phone and he'd put it down and a couple of days later he couldn't find his cell phone. Well, he went right to the sock drawer because that's where his cell phone always ended up. And it was just almost a game for him. As the cell phone would disappear, he'd go find it in the sock drawer. Again, that's just the larger consciousness system working with individuals to help break them out of their 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 rut of, of thinking that life isn't special, that it's not about love, it's about stuff. You know, this kind of breaks you out of that 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 rut of it all being about stuff and material causality and that's not really what it's about so the system works with individuals as well as works with groups you know it can it can do that for a thousand people or just for one so that's if the losing things just that you have it and now you don't have it and it's gone well maybe you didn't need it maybe dealing with the loss is what your lesson is but you can find a lesson in everything. You know, if you lose something and it just disappears, you never see it again. Well, does that make you angry? Does it make you upset? Uh, you know, does it? Uh, you know, how do you react to that? So that's the lesson in itself. So I see everything as a lesson, even those things that are very difficult. Matter of fact, the very difficult are the best lessons at all. Of all, they've got the most potential. So that's about losing things, about music. Music is, is just another way that we express ourselves. And that's whether we're playing it or listening to it. It's a way in which we express who and what we are. It expresses our being level. It's not intellectual. Oh, it could be. There may be some music that you just intellectually pay attention to the words or something like that. But for the most part, music 
works in our uh, intuitive space, not in our intellectual space. And it's an emotional trip. So it's just another way to express yourself. We can express ourselves with, with, uh, you know, with words, with actions, and <clears throat> with feelings. And music and feelings just are part of the same thing. So it's just that, that other piece of space in which we can express ourselves and experience our feelings inside the world of music. So it's a, it's a, music is a very fundamental part of who we are. And that's why music is everywhere. You know, it, it, uh, sound is an important part of our, of our environment. And music is a very special kind of sound that talks to our feelings. All right. So would uh, I think the, uh, the, to rephrase the question, could the frequencies of different music have an effect on the LCS? Have an effect on the LCS? Have an effect on consciousness, maybe? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think in the way that that's intended, like is certain music going to increase the quality of your consciousness and other music take it down? Correct. I think it's, it doesn't do that by itself. It may make your feelings go up. You may hear a certain kind of music and it makes you feel stronger and makes you feel better and makes you feel happier. Well, now you're in a better mood and a better place and you're stronger. And you have music that might make you very sad or may scare you or something else, and you're not such a good place. But that's not the sound making those changes happen. That's you. The sound is just part of your environment, and you are reacting to your environment. So by itself, the sound isn't going to raise your spiritual level or decrease it, but it's, it's how you deal with that sound, how you react to that sound, how you connect to that sound. That's what can raise or lower you. It's your connection to it. But again, it's your choice. You choose how you react to things. Somebody may insult you, and you might think that getting angry would be the right thing to do, but you choose to be angry. You have to take responsibility for all of the things you do. You know, the intention has to, has to be yours and is your responsibility. So if you hear sad music and that makes you sad, which then makes you depressed, it's not, oh, the music made me depressed. No, you made yourself depressed when you listen to that music. And you have to take responsibility for that. And what a great answer. Roger, or Chris, you go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I'll be short with my answer. And I'm going to go left a little bit again. So music. The main structures of our human avatar are called organs. And I think they're called organs for a reason, because with an organ like you'd play at a church, you can make beautiful music from that. So is it possible that we can actually, with our human avatars, create beautiful music through our structure of our organs? And I wanted to say too, I'm feeling like a lot of really good healing energy in this room. I, I'm just definitely sensing it. So I think a lot of us are starting to sync up and it's almost like a conductor of an orchestra or I have this series called Symphony of Realities. And I chose that name very specifically because all of these realities that we're experiencing can become a beautiful symphony. So is it possible that this type of music that our bodies can produce is another way for us to advance with our consciousness and go to another level? Just want to throw that aspect in there. So you're going to answer a question with a question? Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> and I could have brought up 432 hertz and other frequencies people listen to for whatever effects. But yeah, I just wanted to just mention the organs of our body and like how we can literally sing versus when, when that's not happen happening, that's when disease sets in and so forth. Well, how about the second part of the question with disappearing objects? Oh, that could be fairies. Um, <laughs> yeah, th there could be, actually, there could be a lot of reasons for it. Um, it could be another time, like you're, you're vibrating into another timeline where you put the object into another place, you know, remember it, like a Mandela, a personal Mandela effect. I know I put it here, but in another timeline, you put it someplace else. Or take like Nefertiti, the bust of Nefertiti, she has two crystal eyes. 
one of those crystal eyes has been missing for a long time. You know, what happened to that crystal eye? How did that get misplaced? And that's, that leads into another subject, but yeah. By the way, the person that asked this, I really hope you asked Cynthia this question on Monday because she's got a lot to say about that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Sean, go ahead, and then we'll follow up with Roger at the end. Okay. Um, okay, well, I got a lot with it. Okay, so I, I love when objects you know, get lost. At this point, uh, there used to not be, uh, knock on wood, don't need them to go. You know, but I like it when it happens because it's a good opportunity to practice abilities. Um, I, I go into psionics. Uh, so psychic tracking, I practice it every time I lose an object. At this point now, it just comes right in my head what is the, the place, like subconsciously. So, but I, uh, I had to train it to get that way. Before that, in the beginning, it, you, you, ego gets involved and it has a lot of answers, a lot of places. So it's a good opportunity to train this ability. You start with your heart field, you ask questions, you ask it as if it's like Jarvis in Iron Man and it responds to you and it, it, your subconscious recorded everything that's ever happened to you including where you put them or where they are scanning constant emissions from your body ping pong balling back and forth the, imagine there's a compass uh, in all seven directions including going inward and a needle you align that with your heart and you ask it to pull you in the direction of the, where the object is you also want to use all your other senses and train them, including clear audience, clairvoyance, and if you can smell it, go for it. Um, like psych psychic tracking through like bloodhound concept, which some people have the DNA amplification for. Uh, so you can close your eyes and practice all these abilities at once. You may have see an outline of your entire house and the possible options and allow it to light up in color the places where it might be. Don't uh, get disappointed if you're wrong. You're every time you're wrong, you're getting rid of thousands of blocks. That would be a self-defeating program in the ego or the shadow in Kalium. Box would put all self-defeating programs. So you you're clearing that as you get your wrongs out of the way. But you want to have on the map light light up as many possible places as possible and see if you see any differentiation between the lights in your mind and the draw feeling that it takes you to and any other hints that you'd get and then you are f training and sharpening your knife of intuition to translate where it is exactly until uh, it takes maybe a minute takes 30 seconds and eventually it's split second comes right in your head uh, the cause of why this happens can be a lot of things I'd agree with him there's other higher dimensions that like playing tricks on us including our higher self it's like sets it up as like a little test. Um, so I've had many stories where uh, myself now it's like nothing so I'll use other people uh, example. P I went to events and people lost their things they got super emotional about it and like crying and like oh I don't know what I'm gonna do I lost my wallet I, I will be stranded here and you know all these things will start coming up. So I, uh, I I've done this with people multiple times so I said okay this is a test and by the reality, see that big ball of emotions, give it size and scale, use that, hug it, give it love, start sh feeling it as it shrinks down, turn it into the energy you need to shift the reality into which everything just lines up and you get your wallet back. Whether it be if somebody stole it, they're like, oh, I'll take it back, or somebody at the desk finds it, you allow the reality to shift to that level. Damn, she got it back. And um, uh, what about the music? Do you think music uh, uh, affects Have that with many the other people. reality? Yes, and I'd like to riff off what he went into with the organs. Uh, I, you know those devices people like clip to like plants and they start uh, playing a beautiful... Yes. Uh, imagine you do that to all of your organs, little cells, micro, macro, going down and up. I, mean, I already did it with the planets. Uh, everything has a song. And I think in the future, medicine will, as China's character for medicine is the same as music, and they, the ancients knew a lot about this and changing frequency and be able to shift things. You'll be able to affect programming of the body, the emotions, so you can make an orchestra that gets you out of sadness and up to happiness or whatever, uh, a perfect song to start generating emotions, as well as an action into the life. 
So we use music to program ourselves, and it's an orchestra. And I see in the future that we'll have these micro devices that start feel, um, sensing into the symphony in each organ and part of our body, and even disharmony like cancer, and be able to see the song, and then the song of a really healthy person or the antidote to cancer, and then be able to put it there and uh, tune change the instrument. Change one song to another to, to change my song to your song because you're cancer-free and I'm filled with cancer, to, to change my frequency over to match yours to be cancer-free. Yes, so and we're a micro, a macro, sense. everything, so cells, so then that builds up to making the reality better, of course. Perfect. And Roger Marsh, what do you think? So let's start with the missing objects. What, what do you think about objects that have a mind of their own? I don't know how much I can add to what's already been said. I love what everybody has said so far. But uh, I think it, it, with both of these concepts, there's the opportunity for us to be developing ourselves. Who are we in response to the reality we're experiencing? So whether it's an object disappearing or music that we like or don't like, who am I being such that this is occurring? And then what am I learning? How do I want to move forward? So I think in both circumstances, the question is the same. Who am I being? Because for me, and the, the fundamental truth that I'm promoting is consciousness trumps reality. So what are we? We are each consciousness. And it's arising within us. And so something disappears. OK. Consciousness trumps reality. What is the reality I'm experiencing? How is this reflecting back to me my own consciousness? It's coming right back to us. And so with music, it's the same thing. So I love really powerful, uplifting music. And I've come a long way with my musical taste and now pretty much want to listen to uplifting spiritual music. In fact, I had a four and a half minute track I wanted to play at the end of my presentation and I was going to hand out the lyrics because they're so spot on for this event that we're having. And the band is called Indubious. I don't know if anybody's heard Indubious. They do a, a, like a new age reggae, but their lyrics are spectacular. It's a, it's a spiritual healing when, when you're listening to that music. And so for me, listening to that, I automatically come up. But in uh, certain circumstances, challenging music can be really important because it helps develop the muscles. We're, we're like in a spiritual gym. So a lot of, say, breath work or even psychedelic journeys, there'll be difficult music that's played up front. Heavy drum beats, scary sounds, and it stirs up a lot of stuff. And then on psychedelics, it's amplified a thousandfold, and then you've got to deal with that. How do you deal with this disturbing music that's causing things in me? Well, is it the music disturbing these things in me, or is it me? You know, where is this coming from? And so these are opportunities. And in the psychedelic journey, it's incredibly intense. So it's like compact, but it's the same thing. It's just accelerated and deepened. So I say music, yes, uh, choose wisely. You know, that which brings you the highest vibration and is easy to relate to. And when I find myself in circles, whatever's arising that's challenging, how do I work with that? You know, how do I use this? as others are saying, to develop my own capacities. Because that's really what we're doing here anyways, is developing ourselves into this loving, conscious being. That's what I would add. Thank you. I appreciate it, Roger. Love. That seems to be the theme of the day. I absolutely love that that's the theme, right? Yeah, don't worry. Stick around. The jokes only get cornier. Uh, we have one last question for today, folks. Uh, and we are running out of time. We're a little bit over on the clock right now. So one last question for the panel, and we're going to go ahead and shut her down for the night and let you guys get out on the town and have some fun. So uh, last question, sir. Hey, hey thank you. Um, uh, Sean and Chris uh, know know me very well, and uh, hi everybody who's uh, met me uh, since yesterday. Um, you know, I'm a musician myself. Don't have much to my name to speak of, but I've been doing it for many, many, many a year, and uh, I always found that very interesting, right? Because I'm an empath, and so everything was very emotional. I was always very distraught when I picked up guitar because it took took me a long time and I still struggle being able to organize, compose a piece coherently, put the lyrics together. I can do it. It's hard, harder for me to do when I'm alone. I need a band, but eh. But my point is, is that um, I grew up, I found heavy metal at an early age and uh, because I was also an empath, 
I really gravitated on the heavy metal primarily, became metalhead, identify myself as such. But then I, I started to notice, unlike other metalheads, a lot of metalheads just love getting into the abyss. They love the evil, they love the underworld, it's all hail Satan, and this originally has nothing to do with Satan or any of the Illuminati stuff that you know. It's an old Italian symbol of defense. Uh, <laughs> mudras, very interesting stuff. Um, and um, for me, what showed me a real resonance flip, just within a similar style where it can be a little bit about violence, but the aggression, the energy, the power, and all that stuff that can fill your soul when you're full of fears and, uh, and, and all sorts of other personal issues. is like when I started hearing the stuff that was like, like talking about the Norse gods, like all the Viking stuff coming out of the Scandinavian metal music scene, I was noticing that kind of like the way Christian music was, where it was trying to elevate you, it was doing the same thing without what to me was kind of, I don't know, I thought it was cringy, you know, but this stuff, it was just like, be a powerful, strong, uh, in your own person as a concept of a warrior, even though you're crushing your enemy's skulls, it's not really about crushing your enemy's skulls, because... You know, if you meet most metalheads, even the ones into the evil stuff, a lot of them, unless, unless they have other issues, um, are typically very happy and cool people. I, I have a feeling a couple people here might understand exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know. We, we recognize our own, don't we? Um, but, uh, you know, I studied a little bit of music theory, and I understood that things go up in elevation in, in scale, right? You know, you have these half steps and these full steps between notes, how they ended up finding a way to measure sound a long time ago to create musical notation so you could write down an interpretation of audio vibratory frequency. And these intervals bring you up and bring you down. You know, if you meet somebody who is consistently on edge or whatever, um, you might want to soothe them so you may want to take a frequency that can match with them and then you you might want to bring the frequency down a little bit you might want to go down a half step a whole step or whatever right it's the difference between playing in a major key a minor key an augmented key or a diminished key which are more extremes augmented is an extreme version of major and major is considered quote happy emotionally Minor is considered uh, sad emotionally and thus diminished, you know, can almost feel, quote, depressing, if you will. And you can manipulate someone's emotions through the key in which you are playing in. And, you know, that's why you have, you know, if it's a breakup song, it's, it's in a minor. Or if you're being artistic, it's in a diminished because they're diminished and augmented are less appealing, they're more eccentric, they're more for experimental musicians, or if you're just th trying to throw a curveball in a regular sound to make it more uh, interesting. So, um, long story short, what I was realizing was, is that this stuff was uh, music that was inspiring you towards the higher realms without making you feel guilty about the aggression and the power, and giving you something, giving you values and principles that were beyond, like, ah, you see that Bible Je Jehovah guy? He fucking sucks. Guy. Yeah, fuck you. Not, nothing like that, right? It's not about being in that duality. It's about, it's about an allegory for, for real life that is healthy for people being expressed through music that has this spiritual angle. And sometimes it can be dark and mean, but that's only because it's trying to be honest about the human condition as our ancestors have always been striving to be when allowed to. So that's just some input for you guys to share and uh, respond to if you'd like. If there's any way you would allow me to expand on that, because I feel like that's, I was going to ask maybe bad. a very that's similar fine. question. There you go, buddy. So I've always, um, I'm really glad that you mentioned a lot of the stuff you just mentioned. I've always gravitated to what people in my life, like my parents and friends, have considered really dark music. And they've always um, 
you know, some of my friends especially have been like almost concerned, like, why do you feel um, drawn to this? You know, should we be concerned? A lot of questions. Um, but for me, it's always been something that I've, I've, I've very strongly resonated with and has never, I guess, um, made me feel negative emotions or, or put any negativity in my life. In fact, it's done quite the opposite. But I've always wondered because we have so many different belief systems among us. Um, can a frequency be inherently negative or does it completely depend on the individual and how you respond to it? I'm curious because... I like that. I really like that. All right, so um, Tom, on the last round, we'll go ahead and start with you. Can a frequency be inherently negative or is it your response that becomes the negative or the positive? Go ahead. No, the sound is not inherently negative. It's how you respond to it is what's important. So the people that said, oh, that's awful music you're listening to. It's so negative. Well, that's because that's how they respond to it. It makes them feel negative. That's why they say that to you. And people tend to think that everybody else is just like them. So everybody has this assumption that if it makes them feel negative, well, it would make you feel negative too. So the thing is, you listen to it, you're drawn to it, it connects with you in some way, but that way is positive. Then for you, it's positive. It's not negative. And you are having trouble explaining that to them because they're concerned for you. They love you, they care about you, and they're concerned about you. And you just have to smile and say, no, I'm fine. It's okay. I don't find anything negative in it. Matter of fact, I find the opposite. I find that it gives me energy, gives me depth. Um, I soar with it. You know, it's, it's good for me. That's just me. And they probably won't believe you, but that's okay. <laughs> they'll, have to, <laughs> they'll have to accept that, you know, because that's the way you are. But no, there isn't anything inherently negative like that. Sound can do a lot of things. Like I, I have, uh, you know, at my website, I have binaural beats that I have put together over years of experience. And these binaural beats will indeed put you into a theta state. It'll put you into an altered state of consciousness, and it will hold you there. But it can't make you grow up. It can put you in an environment where you can choose to do things that will make you grow up, but it can't do anything to you. In other words, it doesn't force you. It puts you in a space where maybe you have things available that you wouldn't have otherwise, but it's still your choice. So, no, the sound isn't going to do anything to you unless you cooperate with that. Now, if you have a sound and you find it a very scary or negative sound and you play it because it really resonates with your negativity or it resonates with, uh, you know, some awful feeling you have, well, then, okay, but it's still you doing that. The fact that it resonates with you is where you are, not what the music's doing to you. So, no, we're not helpless people that, you know, sounds and things can, can make us go bad or, you know, that sort of thing. They can affect our emotions, but emotions are very personal. And the way they affect your emotions is positive. It gives you depth. It gives you a, a kind of a, a feeling of being connected to something much larger than you is the, is the sense you get from that. And that feeling is a good feeling. You know, it's not necessarily a, a feeling that makes you happy, but it's a feeling that makes you full and kind of, I don't know, satisfied isn't the quite word, but it, uh, it gives. It's something that, that uh, you, it gives to you. So that's good. So you should... As long as you get that, now things might change. If it changes, then you might listen to other things or find other things, you know, that work for you. That's fine. So you're okay. Don't uh, don't let those people uh, talk you into uh, being wrong 
because they don't understand because they're not you. So I will tell you, there's about three rock songs that even to this day, when I get really mad, that's what I got to listen to to calm down. Like, it, they're 90, so I'm not going to date myself and say which ones they are. You guys can take a couple guesses. But, yeah, there's about three songs I'm the same way, but so I, I totally relate there with you. But I'm not on the panel once again. It's these guys. So, uh, Chris, would you like to add anything to the conversation, sir? Uh, yeah, I'd like to bring in Elvis Presley into the room. Um, <laughs> Not literally, but use your imagination. But basically, same type of concept, 1957, Elvis Presley. Uh, so many people were really into his music. Women were fainting, etc. But then there was another generation that thought it was horrible. It was, like, it was like doing bad things to that generation. So it depends on where you're at, and it depends on you know, the frequency and what, and what works for you. But to me, it's like almost like the never-ending story of generation upon generation. I like I used to love house music for example and I still like a lot of it but some people are like that's just noise like how could you like that so again it depends on where you're resonating at reminds me of the great satanic panic of the 80s right remember that no everybody was (laughs) okay so maybe I'm in another timeline let's try that again is that a Mandela effect Uh, a lot of people were afraid that the uh, rock music at the time had the backwards satanic lyrics oh yeah yeah. all that yeah yeah. Uh, Sean, what would you like to add to this, sir? I can go first. So. He said he passes uh, right, last but not least. Roger, last word tonight, sir, on the panel. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation. Again, where, where I would be coming from is that consciousness trumps reality, similar to what Tom is saying, and that um, you know we get to choose our reality. But at the same time, you know, when I listen to music that makes me uncomfortable, that's in me. What's in me that's making me uncomfortable? And that's an interesting indicator or where there's fear. You know, I talked a lot about fear and transforming fear to love. It's a red flag. I'm experiencing fear. It's an opportunity for transformation. There's a, there's something in the world around me, in the reality, in my truth bubble, that's, that's reflecting back to me something. And now I see it. I'm experiencing it. So this music, it's making me feel angry. It's like, well, the anger is already in me. What's going on? Where's that anger coming from? That's the inquiry. That's the opportunity that is being shown to me. So it's, it's all over here, or it's all over there, wherever you are. You're the one at the center of your universe. And we can use that insight. Now, the last thing I would say is something jumped into my mind as we were talking. How many of you are familiar with the band Tool? Tool, that music is dark in my book, man. And I listened to it for a while, and I'm like, whoa, I don't know if I can take this. It's intense. And then because it was it was dark, it felt dark in my being, and I felt uncomfortable in that space. But um, I appreciated the musicianship; they were an amazing uh, band. And then I heard the the lead singer went on to start a, a winery in the desert of all places. Caduceus is what he called it. And there was an interview and a whole documentary made on this man, the lead singer, and he created this wine. And uh, for him, it was a it formed his transformation. He was moving from this angry lead singer of this band into the maker of wine from a place of love. And he said, you know, I was an angry white man on stage yelling out my, you know, trauma of mental, emotional feelings. It was all true for me and it was cathartic. And people came, it was cathartic for them. And so there was a resonance in the field. And for him, it was healing and possibly healing for others to just go into it and now he's at a different place and he still does uh, concerts, but he's just a different man now. He actually has healed through that path. So I thought that's really interesting, you know, because it was a healing path for him and probably for many members of his fan base. So it can be both and. And that's what I would say, and I will pass it to Sean. Oh, yeah. Wonderful question. Thank you so much for bringing up uh, Magical. Uh, and I'd say I'd agree with you all in absolutely. It's not. It's like a tool. It is neutral. It is the consciousness that is using it that makes it polarized in intention, in either beneficial or harmful. And otherwise, it could be used in a, a, ver- a variety of things. So let's say, like sazers, for instance, it's just sound lasers. It could be used to disperse protests and blow out eardrums in people and uh, horrible things or could be used finite surgically to 
like cut out cancer in like a healing method. Uh, it can use in full spectrums. Uh, so then I have also heard it, of course, used in negative uh, tools and sonic methods, like with dark sorcerers using it to negatively invoke uh, dark beings and create portals, but I've also seen it in uh, like churches to invoke angels and positive beings and, and bring out positive emotions in people. Uh, it could also be used to bring a person down, uh, down in a downward spiral, possession and fear, or upward spiral to new heights, creativity, expansion, and even to find their love. Uh, and, you know, people talk about the Illuminati music industry, whether that were, uh, is real or not, you know, whatever you want to believe. They, there's people that use music to program the populace and uh, for their intentions, whatever it may be. Uh, so you can also use it to heal yourself, find happiness, uh, go closer to your true self. It's based on how we interpret things, but also how we're able to uh, receive. So if someone, if someone's created something that with a negative intention or not a negative intention, but it's their intention isn't their own, it's being built upon. Like some people that I've met that go into the metal industry, which I also I used to be a metalhead in high school and stuff. It, it's how you interpret it, but sometimes it may other intentions may built upon it. So light and dark is the secret to this. Dark is not evil. It is more susceptible to evil because it doesn't usually have moral code. It's more interested in freedom, and it may have some weird interpretation on that. That doesn't see itself as everything, and taking the freedom from an another isn't a harm to it because it's in selfish ego mode kind of thing. Uh, but the darkness can become balanced, pure, positive darkness. And everyone within themselves has these things, whether they like it or not, because we're like the fractal macro micro of the all, including all light and dark. So if those things resonate with you, it usually goes into a part of yourself calling you to integrate it. This is called shadow work. It doesn't mean you're accepting darkness. It's more light than anything. You're bringing all the lead consciousness inside you to gold consciousness. You're turning these dormant black stars into uh, vibrant, bright stars. You're getting rid of all the ne negative, self-defeating darkness inside you so that no external darkness has effect over you. And you got to, these are like parts of you in your archetypal consciousness and they don't like each other, the light and dark inside you. You have to like marriage counseling them create boundaries so they don't step over those, define them, so that they don't cross each other's boundaries, they, they can start trading with each other. Like, let's, let's for instance say, dark will take on the masculine role. They have both, the light take on the feminine role. They you know, both again. Say the, uh, I've said this for other people, but for those that haven't heard this, let's say the divine feminine is taking on the role of birthing divinity, light, and making it brighter and brighter, but it's like a moth to flame. It tracks negative external things and it gets shot d down. In order to be balanced, it has to have a masculine as a container, protection, offense, defense, quarantining, whatever you need in boundaries to protect the light as it grows. So, and that would be the masculine or, or taking on the role of the dark, which is lack of light, or being able to survive resiliently in places without any support, which is what darkness is. Bringing them to unity is like turning the enemy that you per previously perceived as an enemy into an anti-hero, and then the, the superheroes team up and take down the real villain, which may be an external threat or whatever. And, and eventual more and more unity as you expand and I, also, this reminds me of a thing that you brought up, which is a big thing I see in that next level of consciousness coming. We need to be able to be able to love our greatest enemy. And if we are able to do that, and there's a bit of attack to it, because it's not easy, then we could change immense things in this reality. It doesn't mean you have to accept it. It doesn't, like, you, 
you don't have to condone what they're doing and you don't have to promote it continuing but those beings are the most in lack of love that exist and they're fractal of everything and they have a representation in you you don't have to affect it externally affect the part that represents that in you you don't have to do it right away build up to it and eventually you ha bring your entire universe to peace and unity inside yourself and the external universe as well in uniting with you and then everything gets behind you and you don't have as many chess player uh, opponents on the board defeating and trying to hold you back from where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to become in your greatest self. And ladies and gentlemen, with that said, that is the first panel for IMEC 2023. Chris Anatra, Sean Bond, Roger Marsh, and Mr. Tom Campbell. Tom, I'd like to personally, on behalf of the entire team, thank you for being here, sir. It has been amazing. You had a wonderful talk. We've had a wonderful panel. And just our top heads off to you, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of day one here at IMEC 2023. We will continue again tomorrow. Same great time, same great place.